<laughs> Fantastic, Gordon, thank you so much. Um, yeah, Gordon and I have also been good friends for a very long time. Gordon had the misfortune to be the person who unwittingly invited me to give the talk at which I first unleashed Sense on the World in 2001. Yeah. I always wonder about that, actually, because three months before that, when I ran a, a small workshop here in the Bay Area in Oakland um, to kind of invite a few luminaries from the field to demolish my work, uh, my, 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 my idea, um, you know, that was three months earlier, and Judy was one of the people involved, but one of the other people who was involved in that workshop and who's been mentioned already today quite a bit, was Julie Anderson, who already, I don't know whether you were actually married by then, but you were certainly dating. In, yeah, right. And somehow she didn't tell him, or at least she didn't tell him enough uh, <laughs> for him to say, please don't talk about all this, please just talk about mitochondria, all right? Um, uh, but anyway, so should I, should I do some, yeah, all right. So Q&A, right. We, yeah, we How long do we have? 20 minutes left. So 20, 20 minutes, minutes brilliant. So I, I actually have, oh, hello. I actually have the first question from no, you Twitter. Don't, no, you don't, no, you don't, no, you don't. I, don't. I have the first question. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead, Aubrey, you ask the first All question. Right. Since we have 20 minutes, I'm going to take Chairman's prerogative and ask a couple of 40,000 foot questions. Uh, I won't take too long. Um, um, so, Judy, uh, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, so, you were talking about how from a therapeutic point of view, I don't think you're really going to need that because we've all still got these. Well, have you? Don't. Oh, you don't, okay. Um, I don't. Uh, right. um, from a therapeutic point of view, you're not too keen on the idea of drugs that would suppress the SAS because you'd have to carry on taking them. You're more interested in ways to get rid of the cells. Um, I'm not really sure that either of those two things is the right way to go because it seems to me that we, if we take into account the antagonistic pleiotropy we're talking about here, the fact that we know SASP is now you know, uh, beneficial in wound healing, uh, that's just only been discovered relatively recently, of course, so who knows how many more things we're going to find that it's good for. Um, the way that I would tend to think about it is that what we must look for is, some th is a different way to get the best of both worlds, a way to let the SASP you know, let the cells be there and let the SASP be there to do the good things it needs to do. And then somehow one step downstream to get rid of the bad things that it does. You know, I mean, inflammation, let's face it, inflammation exists for a good reason. It's just that it's sometimes inappropriately activated. So, I mean, do you think maybe we should try to be looking for ways to get rid of the, um, the, the maladaptive consequences of inflammation or of the SASP rather than getting rid of the SASP itself? I, I, I don't, Arbor. Yeah, let, let me explain why. Um, when there is a wound, senescent cells are induced at the site of the wound. Mm -hmm. That won't go away unless you kill senescent cells at the time of wounding. But meanwhile, the age-related accumulation of senescent cells is what's setting up the tissue. And in that case, what happens is the stem cells don't work as well. So you want to clear those resident senescent cells and then allow them to be induced at the site, at, at the time that they're needed. So the downside of that is that if you have senolytic therapy, um, you wouldn't want to do that before surgery. Before, okay, yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yes, I and I think this is what we have to live for. And, and the reason why I also think this is a better idea is because we know that the molecular control that controls, for example, the inflammatory cytokines overlaps with the ones that control the growth factors that help with wound healing. So I'm not so optimistic we're going to be able to separate good for bad. I think the better thing might be get rid of the senescent cells, and if you suddenly need surgery, we give you the growth factor. So we separate the good from bad, but we do it temporarily rather than spatially, if you like. And, and identify the yeah. factors that are doing the good yeah. and supply them, which is what we did with wound healing. We just topically gave them the growth factor. Great. Um, John, um, going beyond the ovary, going to, talking about tissue engineering in general, I think one message that comes very clearly out of your work is the value of you know, following Einstein's maxim and making everything as simple as possible, but no simpler, you know, um, you know, building something that's a bit sophisticated. Do you think that that's a general rule within tissue engineering, that we're going to get much better results if we, you know, build, you know, things like concentric spheres of things or, or other structures like this, rather than trying to build something that's homogeneous? Well, I think uh, in terms of tissue engineering, 3D works much better than 2D. And uh, in this case, you can do uh, 
forced 3D in terms of what you want to uh, engineer. If you're doing muscle or uh, other uh, potential tissues, um, it's a little bit more complex. You may have to have a scaffolding to, for the cells to set on. But in this case, uh, we're engineering a much simpler piece of ovary. So we're looking just at the follicle itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, three cell types, germ cell, theca cell, granulosa cell. And it appears that the st structural integrity of that is important. Spatial uh, <coughs> aspects are important with this. You can just mix them all together. It doesn't work as well as if they're in their uh, normal uh, structural components or uh, compartments. Uh, given time, they may, cells tend to be very smart. You can put them so into a kind, and they self-organize a little bit. So you can get them to maybe do some of that. But if we can facilitate that and occur it much more rapidly, we may be able to get a product out that, uh, mm -hmm. uh, that can do something uh, in a faster time frame than letting the cells figure it, itself out. Good, yes. Yeah. So, so that's my, been my feeling too, that, that like respecting biology, you know, letting the morphogen gradients do their thing and so on, yeah. Um, so Gordon, um, one thing that you mentioned very briefly and didn't draw too much attention to when you were talking about reproducibility was that the spread that is seen uh, for a given drug in a given lab and so on is not merely a, a bell curve, but it's actually, more often than not, it's actually bimodal. Mm. And this strikes me as something that might be a route towards identifying the dark matter. It seems to me that the first thing to ask is, is the bimodality reproducible? In a given lab with a given compound, if you do an experiment 10 times over a given month and you get a bimodal response, do you still get a bimodal response almost every time the next month? And so on. Yes, and we do. I mean, I think it, over a period of about, the experiments I showed were repeated about six to eight months. Mm -hmm. So at least during that time period, it, was, it would continue to show up. Okay, so if the bimodality is reproducible, even though the individual drug is not, then presumably one would be able to apply the drug in the same lab, okay, and find wh which drugs reproducibly make the bi bimodality go away, yeah, all right, That's and right. then one might have a handle on what the dark matter was. Is that the kind of way you're thinking of going That's about That's right, although, although lots of approaches, I mean, we can, we can set up populations, sample animals, uh, find out if they're in the short-lived or long-lived mode, and then go back and do transcriptomics, for example, or proteomics on, on those animals. So, yeah, lo I, we're, we're thinking about various approaches to this. Um, it's, it's shocking, though. It was really shocking when we started seeing this, and we continued to do the, the experiments over and over again because we kind of didn't really believe it, but mm. there it was. Um, so the first question, and the only question we've had from Twitter is for Gordon, and it says, in hypervariable compounds, any known effects on bacteria fed to worms? Oh, great question. So oh, good. <laughs> these, uh, these worms are, are sitting on a plate with, with a E. coli bacteria as a food source, and um, we commonly use live bacteria because that's optimal for the worm health. But actually, uh, dead, we can grow these things on dead bacteria as well. So you can eliminate the possibility that bacterial metabolism is playing a part in this. And the hypervariability, yeah, I mean, at this point, it, it could be due to differences in the bacterial culture. But I should say, we've got standard protocols that would send you off to sleep if you wanted to read them tonight, uh, detailing exactly how we grow that bacteria, exactly how it's applied to the plates and so on. But it's, it's absolutely a possibility. Great. Any other questions? Up, oh, we have a gentleman up here. Hi. So um, my question is, uh, I had two questions. One was, uh, the first one's for Judy, um, and that was, uh, following up on what Aubrey said, I think what Aubrey, um, Aubrey's idea that you really want to do this in a way where you get the best of both worlds makes sense. And, I suspect that evolution itself had that, I, had, had that idea, if evolution could be said to have any ideas in mind, um, when it set up the, the, uh, the process of cellular senescence, it's very possible that the reason it evolved isn't as, is as much for this wound healing and possibly development as it would be for, um, for pre preventing cancer. So we know a little bit about how the senescent cells are cleared naturally, and I believe natural killer cells have been identified as one of the basic mechanisms, and it's possible 
that the real defect in aging that we see in many of these vertebrates is that the loss of function in natural kill cell, killer cell or equivalent population of the immune system that's supposed to remove these cells um, is really the, the root cause and possibly stimulation of the natural killer cell population or rejuvenation of that population to better recognize um, the, uh, the, the uh, senescent cells. Maybe that would be the way to get the best of both worlds. Um, any thoughts? Yeah, it, it's a great idea, but it's wrong. <laughs> no, pe people have, have asked that question. I'll just remind you that although the adaptive immune system tends to decline in, in functionality with age, that's not necessarily true of the innate immune system. In fact, if anything, the innate immune system becomes hyperactive. So if you look at the function of natural killer cells against senescent cells, so other factors might change, I mean other functions might change, um, it's not because the natural killer cells are not working as well when isolated from an older organism compared to young. What does seem to be the case is that, so I told you that senescent cells um, produce proteases. And if you look at the amount of proteases that are produced by any given senescent cells, you get a beautiful Gaussian distribution. Turns out that the cells that resist natural killer killing are the ones that are the very high producers. So it could be nothing more than stochastic variation in MNP production and the high producers are now protected and then they just accumulate with age because they're being made at the same rate or a faster rate. Are you sure you've ruled out, even though the natural killer cell function might be just as good or not better, are we sure that the homing devices in the natural killer cell, for example, a differentiation um, drifting, is their ability to recognize the senescent cell reduced at all? Well, they, they recognize cell surface antigens. So senescent cell... <laughs> Time out. <laughs> okay. So senescent cells produce, express ligands for natural killer cells on their surface. Right. Natural killer cells express receptors for those ligands. And those receptors don't change with age. Okay. So. I, you I know, won't. it could, but it, you're right, it could be some phosphorylation. I mean, you, you, can, you can never rule out a negative, right? Y yes. Okay, well, thank you. Um, the question was just really just a point for, for Gordon Lithgow, which was, have you investigated the microdensities of the bacterial, of the uh, worm growth on the plates for looking for the bimodality? In other words, might there be, not, not the macro density, obviously, but could there be two sets of patterns, especially one where mm, sometimes the worms will cluster, there'll be more larger clusters of worms versus smaller clusters? We, we haven't collected data on that. Anecdotally, we don't see anything that's the same number of animals on the plate in each experiment. Um, they generally are behaving the same. Some of these species are, are really, um, well, they're wild uh, they, they compared to the lab strains, and some of them flee the plate, and so you end up having you know, a, a different number of animals. So it's definitely worth thinking about. I mean, in to do with like, density, we can certainly go back and simply look how many animals l did we end up scoring and, and ask for a correlation. Well, well, you might want to take pictures of the plates and, and have a computer calculate the mean densities between yeah, animals. Yeah, we, we, we actually have a system, an automated system for lifespans that does exactly that. Okay, are there any up? Oh, of course, at the farthest end of the room. Oh, actually, can I pass this to you? Yeah. Do I get to ask some questions first? Um, I have a question for every person up there, but, but I'll start with Judy and just ask the question. When you have those growth, growth curve and you're making the point that there's a wide um, life extension curves, that there's a wide ex uh, extension in the middle of age but not at the end, so is the, is the uh, dichotomy between the wound healing and the, the good and the bad part the same in the middle as it is in the end, meaning? So, so are you asking when you have a, wild, a worm that's untreated, uh, worm, <laughs> when you have a mouse that's untreated, whether, and we know wound healing declines with age, whether wound healing is then comparably better at the same age in those animals exactly. with the, yes. yes. So Jan, we, we didn't do those experiments, but Jan did those experiments. He claimed there was no effect on wound healing whatsoever when he eliminated senescent cells, as long as he didn't eliminate it at the time of wounding. 
effect. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, so sure. pre-clearing, he claims there's no effect. We just haven't looked at that. Okay, two quick questions. One's for John. When you make follicles, can you take a, a disease, for example, in Fragile X where there's follicular failure, um, can you take something like that that's already a little bit on the edge and actually create something better? We haven't done disease states at, at this point, uh, but that's where things would lead. Uh, we've done it for other uh, tissue types, such as uh, cell therapies uh, for a kidney failure. We've taken diseased kidneys, grown up the cells, and it's, it's such that it appears that the uh, cells that are causing the, the chronic kidney disease don't expand and don't grow in the culture, and we select for more healthy. For those healthy, yeah. That and then makes we can use sense. that as a cell, cellular therapy. We're thinking that, that we might be able to see something very similar, uh, but with the genetic defect, you may not. Uh, right. You may actually have to, um, in that instance, you may have to add a lot more technology, isolate IPS, correct the defect, and then differentiate down other pathways. So, you know, it gets very complicated in terms of how you want to approach something like that. So this is the last question, if I'm not being too long, and that is, what about microbiome? I mean, you have the, you know, you're treating, uh, you, you may have been getting at that with the, with the uh, E. coli or whatever, but, you know, it seems like these anti-aging drugs and what's coming out about the, um, the uh, microbiome might be something really important. And I don't know if anybody has looked at that. Yeah, I mean, it, it probably almost definitely is important. In fact, Pankaj Kapahi here at the Bark has uh, looked at the effects on growing worms on various mutations in, in bacteria, and there are massive differences based on single gene events in, in the bacteria. So it's undoubtedly important. Uh, in our experiments, we try to control it by having just, it's a monoculture of E. coli. Uh, we don't go in and look for rare bacteria in, in the worms, and that might be something we end up doing, but really important. But what I can share with you is, um, th this is a little bit anecdotal, but the lifespan of C57 black mice at the Mayo Clinic is different, it's shorter, than the lifespan of C57 black mice at the Buck. And one of the differences between those two sites is the acidity of the water, which almost certainly affects the microbiome, so very possible. And I think we had one more question over here, our last question. Uh, Kelsey Moody, Icor Therapeutics for uh, Gordon. Um, I applaud your efforts not to just answer these questions, but to answer them well. Um, we're doing GLP or rolling that out, so I appreciate the headache that, uh, that that all is. Um, have you looked or had any experience at QA and QC on consumables and reagents? Um, in our lab, we've found a lot of variability, even from reputable uh, sources with that. I was wondering if you could speak to that. Yeah, so what we do is to uh, source every reagent from a single manufacturer and then distribute it to the three sites. Now, that doesn't say that you're getting what you think you're getting, but at least it's the same thing in all three, three sites. And then we are going forward and doing some, um, some uh, mass spec on the compounds themselves. We have one compound, for example, that, that under, undergoes an oxidation effect, and that's likely to cause toxicity, we think. So, so yeah, we have to be very careful about that. And as, as you know, if you just go into a health food store and pluck something off the shelf, chances are you're not getting what you think you're getting, so it's a really important issue. Okay, well, it's time now for our break. So thank you both all very much. We've had a wonderful session.